In the wake of recent massacres, America has been asking itself searching questions about its apparent addiction to guns. There are now so many tragic mass shootings, they actually air public information films telling you how to survive. I'm not making this up. It may feel like just another day at the office. But occasionally, life feels more like an action movie than reality. This helpful video, which looks a bit like the most harrowing episode of The American Office ever made, teaches you how to react if a man with a shotgun goes berserk in your workplace. Apparently, you should run. If you can't run, you should hide. And if you can't hide, well... And commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. <laughs> Graceful. Look at that, there's four of them and only one of him. Cowards! Looking at this, it's little wonder the calls for tighter gun controls are growing louder. Well, they have to be loud to be heard over the constant sound of gunfire and screaming. It's a hot-button issue that's livened up Piers Morgan's CNN show considerably as pro-gun guests turn up to shout at him. And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. Does it the whole thing's become a sort of interactive game show where the viewer has to decide who the biggest prick is. I don't know, is it the shouty prick or the slimy prick? I just don't know. This week, thousands marched on Washington to call for stricter gun control. We will not step back! I wish you would. I can hear you from here. And I'm in Britain. But gun control faces an uphill struggle because some sections of US society seem to love guns more than their own children and they feel under threat. If only gun owners had some means of defending themselves. Fox News did their bit for trigger lovers with a QVC-style rundown of some of the most popular killing machines on the market, showcased by a hot markswoman, seen here demonstrating the type of gun used in the Sandy Hook massacre. Probably one of the most popular rifles in the US right now, thanks to all the media attention. Yeah, you know what? I don't know that the media coverage has made it popular with everyone. Everyone says it's so big and scary, but that's simply... These are cosmetic features that have no bearing on the firearms functions at all. Although, just to be clear, those firearms functions will kill you. My five-year-old nephew uh, harvested his first deer about a month ago with my competition rifle, and he was able to make this fit him. There you go. So simple a child could use it, but not outrun it. Still, the young guns do start young in the US, and their guns aren't quite so cosmetically terrifying as Five News graphically demonstrated. This one is pinky. It's my pink. 22 AR-15. And then this one is Pinkalicious, my pink 22 chambered pistol. But not all kids like guns. In emotive scenes on CNN, Obama announced his plans for gun control, flanked by children who'd contacted him to ask him to do something. You know, in the letter that uh, Julia wrote me, she said, I know that laws have to be passed by Congress, but I beg you to try very hard. Julia, I will try very hard. Oh, brave move, resurrecting the Jim will fix it format in this day and age. The National Rifle Association also uses kids in the row, as in this bullish advert accusing Obama of hypocrisy because his children have armed guards. Are the president's kids more important than yours? Uh, yeah. Charismatic NRA spokesman Wayne Lapierre also did his bit in a startling speech in which he claimed the only way to stop gun massacres in schools was to put more guns in schools because... The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So what you're saying is, when the bad guy turns the gun on himself, he becomes a good guy and dies a hero. He also blamed old computer games. Vicious, violent video games with names like Bulletstorm, Grand Theft Auto, Mortal Kombat and Splatterhouse. Although, for some reason, this NRA spokes twat failed to mention certain games which had the news exercising their right to be up in arms. The National Rifle Association has taken the controversial step of launching its own video game. Yes, NRA practice range is intended to teach youngsters to shoot, and it's not the only NRA game. A few years back, they released this, NRA Varmint Hunter, which encourages the player to bravely murder unarmed critters like a big, brave hero. Quick, it poses no threat. Kill it. Hero! Looking at all of that, it's hard to work out why anyone would want to even live in America anymore. Well, here's someone who does. It's US comedian and drunk Doug Stanhope. He's going to convince you that the USA is great, apparently. I'm Doug Stanhope, and that's why I drink. 
America is fucking great. And it really is. I know you don't want to hear this from me, but that's the truth. Brits love to bitch about America and they love to hate America. The government and the wars and the torture. But that's not life here, come on. Life in America is actually fantastic. Everything works. Come here, I want you to be here. Just get a nonstop from Heathrow, go directly to Florida, walk down that ramp and tell me if you can't immediately sense something's really good here. Rent a car, get a convertible, fill up the tank. Look at the price fucking eleven dollars a gallon over there look at the price you're gonna fill up your tank you're gonna fill up the back seat as well just just because it's that fucking cheap comparatively drive down big empty highways drive to the beach there'll be a half a dozen cabana bars open it's only eight o'clock in the morning and they're, they're waving at you they're smiling at you and they're waving for you to come on in they want you to be there because they don't know yet that you don't tip Come on in, come on in. <laughs> have a seat at the bar. She's gonna hand you a big breakfast menu. It's this big. You know what we have for traditional American breakfast? Choices. Yeah, lots of choices. You want some eggs? How do you want them done? We can do them 10 different ways. You want French toast? You want waffle? Pancakes? We have chocolate chip pancakes. They'll put a, a whipped cream smiley face right on there for your fucking British ass. Or maybe you want a whipped cream frowny face to match that dour expression. You're still trying to fight liking it here. Order a cocktail, and she's gonna do something you've never seen before. She's gonna pour it like this, and she's gonna go up and down, and she keeps pouring it. How can this possibly be right? In the UK, when you order a mixed drink, some scientist pops out of the floorboards in a lab coat, and he's a system of weights and measures, and a fucking stainless steel cylinder that assures that you will not get any more, even the vapors of more than one measured ounce in your fucking $15 cocktail. Life here is really fucking good. Yeah, we have a lot of dumb people here, but you can afford to be dumb here. Everything makes sense. You're lost, you don't know where you are. You're, where are you? 77th Street? Go a block. You know what's next? 78th Street! It makes sense. You don't have to think. It's not like your roads that are all crisscross and mishmash, and they're all built 1,100 years ago for donkeys and carts, and you don't know where the hell you are or where you're going. Hitler did his best to help the UK and level that country flat so they could start over like extreme country makeover. And what did the Brits do? They spat in Hitler's face and built it back brick by brick exactly the way it was 1100 years ago when it didn't make sense. Come to America, you can stay on my couch. If you don't like it after a week, I'll give you your money back. My God, amazing. Uh, now here's something else that may or may not be amazing. I don't know, I haven't seen it. It's just a generic link. It starts now. The original Django movie was an ultra-violent spaghetti western so full of this kind of carnage it was banned in Britain for many years. Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained, however, is an outrageous action movie set against the laugh-a-minute backdrop of slavery. <laughs> Hello, you poor devils. It stars Jamie Foxx as the eponymous Django, a slave freed and mentored by the idiosyncratic bounty hunter Dr. King Schultz. After making money in the bad guy shooting industry, Django and Schultz set out to rescue Django's missing wife, Broomhilda, from the clutches of racist shitbag Leonardo DiCaprio and his uncle Tom Housemaster, played by Samuel L. Jackson, disguised as Uncle Ben of Three Minute Rice fame. You scared me. Why is I'm scaring you? Maybe she's racist. Django plays fast and loose with anything resembling facts in a similar vein to Inglorious Bastards, which also ran around with a history book on its head farting the A-Team theme tune. Like Bastards, Django is both grim and hilarious and contains both the tensest and funniest moments you'll see on a cinema screen this year, and a bit where a naked man has his penis shot off. You had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. Basically, it makes slavery worth it. Joining me now to talk about Django are stand-up Susan Kalman and human fact factory Richard Osman from Pointless, who has slaves himself. <laughs> I do, yeah, I do. <laughs> so this is the second film in a row where Tarantino has basically driven a bus through quite a sensitive topic. Because, I mean, in Glorious Bastards, it was Nazis. Mm. Uh, this time, it's slavery. I thought it was yeah. great. I mean, it's the same film as in Glorious Bastards. It's identical. I was really pleasantly surprised how much I laughed in it as mm. well. 
It's uh, a film about slavery, but it's funny about slavery. But you know what? Genuinely, on a serious point, mm -hmm. he's made a film about slavery that people are going to go and watch. It's actually quite recent past, and you do forget what happened. Yes, so but, you... I mean, come on. It's not exactly a, a, a watertight historical document. This, no, though, but then... But, OK, yeah. so Spielberg made Amistad, and, you know, that's a proper, almost sort of documentary-style, mm. uh, you know, account Very reverential, of, of slavery. But, yeah. Exactly. But, you know, I haven't watched it. Yeah. So Amistad is a worthy film, is what you're basically saying. You wouldn't go and see a worthy film about slavery, but you'll go and see a cartoon where a lot of where a man gets his penis well, I, shot. I'm off. not going to see a film about slavery. Essentially, I'm going to see a Quentin yeah. Tarantino film, as are lots of people. And you know, what? it made me think about you slavery don't for. Care it about made me think slaves. Wow. Oh, oh. Yes. oh. it sounds Gosh. a bit like you don't that really care sense. about slavery. What you're saying yeah. is, I'll care about slavery if you throw in enough people having it's their penises shut off to amuse me. Me, yeah. the king. Like, amuse me. <laughs> yeah. Come on. I demand entertainment before I'll even remember your <laughs> suffering. Afterwards, I thought for 45 to 50 seconds about slavery. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, is, about which, I, which I wouldn't have done. And also across the country, lots of people thinking for yeah. 45 seconds about slavery, and that all adds up. There's been a lot of talk about the amount of violence um, in the film and in, in films in general. There's a particular shootout in it where there's a guy he uses as a kind of human shield who just explodes like a bag of blood. <laughs> and I was, I was kind of helpless with laughter at that. Is that because I'm unhinged or, or, or what? Why, yeah. wasn't, why wasn't the violence <laughs> disturbing? Well, it's not disturbing. I wouldn't say it's hilarious. It wasn't, you know, top ten comedy moments, Dale Boy <laughs> falling through a bar. <laughs> laughter. But uh, it was funny in that it was quite cartoonish. There was so much at one point, mm. it was like someone throwing red paint at the screen. There's a lot of blood. Whoever's in yeah. charge of the lot blood, of blood did a really good job. Yeah. Having done the Nazis <laughs> yeah. and made the Nazis fun, and having done slavery and made slavery fun, what could Tarantino possibly tackle next? I'd like to see him doing the suffragettes. When you say doing the suffragettes, what do you <laughs> well, mean? Well, not exactly? him doing Holding the suffragettes. Them down? I would like a, to see Tarantino's take upon the suffragette movement, because they were actually quite violent, some of the suffragettes. Were uh, they, they blew up churches, and also it was quite vicious, the way they, they force-fed them through the mouth and also tried to feed them through the anus. That they force-fed suffragettes through the anus? Through the anus. That's absolutely true. That's not biologically possible, Well, surely, they it? didn't know a lot in those days, though. I'm not saying one would do it now. No, one wouldn't force feed a woman through the anus, no. It honestly feels to me this discussion is, is for the red button. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me. It's time to end this bit, which I've done really smoothly like that. Thank Go away. Try. Now we're going to look at this. Excitement in the USA as President Barack Obama is sworn in as President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And Demonstrating far better control of her lips, popular songstress and bum owner Beyonce rounded off the spectacle by belting out the national anthem. But then controversy, as some claimed Beyonce had lip-synced the words, and a fierce debate broke out across the news channels as everyone debated whether this was right or wrong, or even mattered. Did she fake it? And if so, why should we care? Still, whether live or pre-recorded, there's no denying Beyonce makes a sweeter sound than Mr. President ever will. I mean, Beyonce can hit a pitch-perfect high note. The best Obama can do is let out a sort of ugly drone that kills everyone in the village. Royalty. And as Lord Harrington Wales completes his tour of duty, Sky News treats us to an intimate tour of beauty, as we saw just what he's been up to down Soldier Town Way. When not machine-gunning shepherds from the skies, Harry's job seems to largely consist of dressing up as Pippi Longstocking and playing FIFA on the PlayStation. Surprised he's got a PlayStation, I'd have thought he'd use a Royal Wii. <laughs> I'm one of those people that love playing PlayStation and Xbox, um, so with my thumbs, I like to think that I'm probably quite useful. Harry's apparently flippant comparison between killing the Taliban and playing a video game didn't go down that brilliantly. Still, it's hard to fathom what people thought he was doing in Afghanistan, since Apache helicopters are a bit killy, as is army life in general, which is why he's got so much fearsome equipment. This is really just a flying gun, and he's in charge of it. He's got a big cannon under his cockpit, a handgun on his waist, and a terrifying four-colour Bic pen strapped to his shoulder. He can write in red, green, blue or black. Take that, Taliban. Actually, Harry spent most of the interview complaining more about the media than the Taliban. God knows why he hates the press so much. I mean, all they've done is hack his brother's voicemail, print photos of his bum, call him a Nazi and be implicated in the tragic death of his mother when he was 12 years old. I mean, get over it. Although, to be fair, the media do get things wrong. Sky News don't even seem to know his name. They think he's called Andy. Andy.
and he's off away from the cameras and the questions captain wales runs back to the life he's come to love oh, sorry i forgot you were still there uh, that's about all we've got time for this week we'll see you next week until then go away <laughs>